kid. Seriously. Okay, gentlemen. So uh, two days ago, I finally got out and saw Spider-Man Far From Home. Uh, thoroughly loved it. I, I know neither of you two saw it, so we're not going to get into a real discussion either about the movie and uh, definitely not going to let any spoilers go for anybody listening out there who hasn't seen it. Um, but there are two things that um, got me thinking, and they're actually both the mid and closing credit scenes of the movie. Uh, both of them set up plot points for the MCU going forward. The, the mid credit scene is really kind of clear in where it's sending its characters next and the, the story path it's taking. The last one is a little more ambiguous uh, about where uh, Marvel Studios might go with it. Um, so that got me thinking about what we're going to be seeing in phase four of the Marvel Universe because we know right now that they haven't really announced much. I mean, we know there's a, a Guardians of the Galaxy 3 coming. We know there's a Doctor Strange 2, a Captain Marvel 2. Um, they've mentioned the Eternals, and that's really it. And not only that, but it doesn't really give us a feel kind of what the general direction uh, of the universe is going. And so I'm assuming we'll probably get some more ideas from that at Comic-Con at the end of this month, because I think they've got a, a studio um, booked for a, a time period. But in the meantime, uh, we are able to fill the gaps by endlessly speculating about what we want to see in the, the coming phase four. And so I wanted to toss it out to you guys uh, about not necessarily what you think they're going to do, but what you would like to see uh, a particular character, a particular team that you want to come next in phase four. Um, you know, maybe if you have casting ideas or you know, how you see it contributing to this expanding cinematic universe going forward. So that's me teeing it up. And uh, I don't know if either of you want to take a swipe at the ball yet. Well, I can go ahead and start. I think uh, the obvious answer for me would be Fantastic Four, um, the X-Men with Gambit, the X-Men with Rogue, or the X-Men with Colossus. Those would be kind of the all of the characters that I'd really like to see. Also, Daredevil. I don't think that they would put him in the MCU as close to what we have with the Netflix series and all that. But um, So I'm going to try to think outside the box. And A character that I've always really liked is Spider-Woman. I've always thought she was had kind of like an interesting backstory. She kind of mixes the whole spy thing and um, just kind of a cool character that hasn't really been explored yet. I'm a little bit worried if they did that, it might, you know, because the line's always been gray um, between her and Spider-Man, and there's not really like a relationship there really per se. They're really kind of completely different characters, and so... Um, but I just, I've always liked uh, that character, and so I'd like to see her on the big screen. So what, Do you have any casting ideas for who you'd well, want? That's a question. I, I haven't really thought too much about it. I've been so, you know, worried about the Fantastic Four, and, and kind of, that's been where my headspace is. So if I had to, to cast one gal as Jessica Drew... Let me think about it. Let me think about it. Come back to me. But I, I have a follow-up question because I don't know much about her at all. So what is it about that character that that you attach to so much? Just uh, she's just kind of like it's it's kind of I always preferred her over Black Widow, and they have similar stories. But she's kind of a a tragic figure where she uh, and I can't remember the storyline. Mark would have to help me. Where she is kind of the person who backstabs the Avengers and kind of brings them down and I always just kind of like that about her I mean Marvel is known and one of the things that was really grown up on me as I've gotten older is that that Marvel operates between the black and the white and the, the characters are neither wholly good nor wholly bad and she kind of epitomizes that where I think Black Widow tried to do that I think just it hit more for me when I was reading those things and maybe it's because Black Widow as a character really came of age before I really started reading comics. Um, but I just I just kind of like that duality of her character. And you were never really sure kind of who who she was or whose pocket she was in. 
Sure. The, the backstory is her parents were agents of Hydra who experimented on her, and that's how she got her powers. And she's always sort of operated, I mean, whenever an author required it, she sort of has operated as a, a double agent who is kind of always being pulled between the these you know dual loyalties. And so there's um, also two... You know, spoilers for anybody who hasn't read this, you know, 12-year-old comic. Um, she is the main character replaced in Secret Invasion when the Skrulls are taking over the world. So that's, even though that wasn't her per se, that's kind of baked into the character that this, she is always someone that nobody ever completely trusts um, because they've been burned by her or someone pretending to be her repeatedly. So mine's kind of mine's kind of in a similar vein, though though different. And I have so I grew up, you know, X Men, Wolverine. That was my my big thing. But I, I'm tired of them. I, I don't want to see them in a movie. I mean, I it, it was a good time because I got to hang out with Maya right before we moved away. But man, what a waste of twelve dollars that that last Dark Phoenix movie sure was. I liked um, it. Oh, it's it's so nothing. It's so blonde, nothing. And that's my my least favorite type of movie. Like, even Suicide Squad is just an abject failure of a movie, but it's so ridiculous. I've watched it multiple times because it's so bad. Where Dark Phoenix is just a, a retread of everything you've seen, just with less to do, less to say, and actors who don't care. But anyways... <laughs> I am uh I I am I'm done with that franchise. I think it being on the shelf for for 10 years could only or maybe not that long, but being on the shelf for 5 years is a good thing for it. So it builds up some actual excitement and anticipation to see those movies instead of the kind of ugh, we're getting another one. Um and and I'm going to gravitate to to another another female character who's a little bit of an offshoot of a, a a male character again like Maya had, but one that we don't get to see on their own or as much as I probably would have liked and part of that has to do with movie rights and part of that has to do with bad movies, but I want I want a She-Hulk movie. I think that would be a really kind of fun and interesting character to bring in there. The the things that are different about her is she isn't just a berserker when she's in her Hulk mode, so you can have a little bit more of a story and not have her just smashing tanks in the desert and mutant dogs and looking sad for a while. Um, you know, she's a lawyer. She's also got that Deadpool talk to the break the third wall type element, which would be another way you could bring Deadpool, start easing Deadpool in, because I'm assuming that one's going to happen sooner rather than later, since he's an easy transition to the MCU and he's the most popular Fox property that they're currently getting. So, you, you know, let, let's see a Hulk movie that's actually fun and interesting to watch. Let's uh, let's get a She-Hulk movie in there. Do you, do you have a cast uh, a decision for that? I, I don't, so I'm just going to say Viola Davis because she's better than everyone else at everything. So And and she's not currently in the MCU, so until I, I think of something better, I'm going Viola Davis. Oh, I'll, All right. Um, Maya, back to you. you you've cast uh, Jessica Drew yet? No, I, all I can keep thinking of is Alexandra Daddario, but I don't know if she's got the acting, acting chops for what mm. I'm looking for, but as far as like the pale blue eyes, that's all that's coming to mind. Might, yeah. might be a bit cheesecakey for that role. I don't know. She, I mean, she she held her own in True Detective. Like, it's not a huge role, but it's not. You know, it it wasn't Blake Lively and uh, y- you know, in the town type. What are you doing here? You're like, you know, who knows? Maybe no one's just giving her the chance. That's possible. So, uh, you know, far from original, a lot of uh, different people online have, have been saying this, but. One of my concerns is that over 20-some movies, the the Marvel tone might be starting to get a little stale. Um, every movie is very similar with the same kind of character beats, the same rough plot structures. They, they tonally, you know, there's they're all interchangeable, right? I mean, there may be a few more jokes in Ant-Man than, say, Civil War, but you could easily splice scenes from these movies next to each other and you wouldn't notice a shift. So I really feel like going forward in phase four, Marvel needs to start playing with that more. Um, And one of the ways to do it, I think obviously is to go dark. Um, Now with the new Joker movie coming out, which is basically taxi driver with clown makeup, apparently um, we're getting, it feels like these movies going in a darker way. And I think Marvel would be good to, to get on that and to start incorporating it. And I think they did a pretty good job with their TV shows, but I, I don't think the TV shows have integrated to the movies in quite the way everybody was anticipating them doing. And, and they've kind of existed separately. So I, I want a dark 
darker tone. And I think the way to do that is to go with Moon Knight, which is basically the the Marvel's answer to Batman when they're not using Daredevil as their Batman. Um, he's schizophrenic. And so you've got that sort of dangerous element of, of insanity, darkness, you know, street level uh, crime and villains. And I, I think that that's a way you can take this in a different direction. Um, what are his he, powers? Does he have powers or is he just a guy with sticks or? Um, he doesn't. He, it's. He's basically being guided by an Egyptian god, but he doesn't really have quote unquote superpowers. Okay. It's more sticks and high tech gadgets, and he's batshit crazy, um, is really his thing. So, um, and I, I know he's been cast Venom already, but since that isn't technically integrated into the into the Marvel CU, I was thinking Tom Hardy would be really good at portraying you know a mercenary who is also kind of nuts and would sort of bring that that menace level i think you need to it even from behind a mask is moon knight a white guy in general yes okay he is. now I, again i would certainly be open to somebody else um who is not white i i don't think that his being white is integral to the character so you know they put somebody else in there that'd be fine tom hardy was just kind of the first one sure. who came to my mind um but that's that's where i would go next i i agree with you i don't want to see the x-men in the marvel universe in any time soon beyond deadpool and i think you use i i think they should only really be integrated through deadpool like have have more of them in deadpool movies but not not give them their own franchise that they just need to be put on the shelf for a while, I think. Well, and with such an established universe, and I know now we have maybe some split timelines or whatever, but like, how do you even bring in mutants at this stage? Cause you can't just all of a sudden have half the population or, you know, a fourth of the population be mutants that have been around for forever. You know, like yeah. what do you, Yeah, I, I don't even know how they attempt it. I mean, I suppose the only way they do it is to, to do it through fractured timelines. Right. I mean, you could do that. I mean, you could also say, I suppose, something like Professor X is telepathically keeping their presence a secret from the world, but that's really kind of ham-handed, I think, and you know, doesn't doesn't really hold up under much scrutiny. But that's the only other way I could think of it. Yeah, well, un unless you just you really go bold with it and say this is the the first generation of them are happening now so you make you know professor x a teenager and you know maybe maybe magneto's a guy just trying to cross the border uh, rather than a, a holocaust survivor Ooh. or whatnot i mean if you really want to get weird you know or get get abstract with it and still kind of make it fit in this world because i have a hard time believing that there's you know an entire race of people that <laughs> spontaneously now they're all established and they've all been in hiding during all these other massive superhero events that have been going on well, and that everyone's going to hate them. <laughs> right. Well, and they've been basically by doing that, I mean, you strip apocalypse of his backstory, you strip Magneto of what is arguably the most interesting backstory of any character in comics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like that would really be destroying kind of what's good about them um, to, to do that. But I don't know, Maya, you're kind of silent over there. I'm just trying, I'm trying to think of a way to do it because I think it's absolutely necessary that the mutant thing is brought in. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I think phase four will be over before any we see any of this stuff that I want to see, frankly, because I do want to see what uh, Feige has to do with the X-Men because I think they're the most interesting thing out there. I mean, I'm more excited about seeing, or I was more excited about going to see Dark Phoenix and so many other movies simply because of who the X-Men are. And even though my favorite char characters come from every sort of, you know, corner of the DC and Marvel universe, um, really, like, the, I'm always up for an X-Men movie and always up for a mutant movie. So the reason I'm quiet is I'm, like, racking my brains trying to think about how to make it work or how... I don't want it to be, like, alternate timelines. I'd much rather just have, like, Xavier be super scared that his students are going to get hurt and so that he's kept them a secret and they've been underground and maybe doing stuff for a while. I don't, well, I don't really I, know. I, um, I, think that, to I think the easiest solution is is that you you start out with there being 
20 mutants total. So you can have Professor X and he's been around, but him and Magneto were about the only two that they knew of existed for, you know, 50 years. And then they found a few others. So the whole mutant population of the world is, you know, 50 people maybe. And then they're starting to see an uptick in them or whatever. So then you can start doing it. But like, you can't just all of a sudden be like, there's a bunch of them. They've been around for forever. I think it was always easy in comics because at least, and I don't know if this is the right way to think, but I always just thought of it as the X-Men were kind of off in their own universe unless they were helping out somebody from another comic. Like, I always just kind of thought of them almost like I think of the Fox movie universe where it's kind of like their own thing, and that was how it was fine for me in the comics. But now, like, that I'm thinking about it, I mean, yeah, why, why would everybody hate the mutants when they're, you know, when they love the Hulk. Yeah, the, su- the superhero superpowers have saved everything about them. And it's easy to put the X-Men team on an island, but if they're a race of people that's millions across the the world, it's not so easy to put that on an island when you've created this very interconnected world. I mean, that's that's what's probably the biggest strength of the MCU is how interconnected it is to each other. And it's, I mean, I you know, I suppose you could say the same thing about magic, right? But... I mean, that's a little different because you have to go learn it and it's not as many people or whatever, but it, it, it's a really big fantastical element to introduce in one shot. Yeah. And to your earlier point, too, the, the, the comics have kind of addressed the, the why are people hate mutants but cool with Spider-Man. And it, the, the, the kind of the argument that they use is that, well, because it's freak accidents and it's kind of really unusual chance that some people get superpowers, but being mutant is something that your kids could be born with. Right. So you have like a one in, you know, a hundred chance that your kid is going to be a mutant, whereas it's a one in three billion chance a radioactive spider is going to bite them. So there's just that kind of fear that, oh, this could happen to me and my family that propels anti mutant hysteria, whereas they don't care as much about other heroes, even though there, there are repeatedly times in the comics where people say to mutants, I don't know why they hate you and they love us. So I, I don't think that's a problem with it. Um, I think, though, to get to Luke's point, is that you, you can't go from zero to the anti-mutant hysteria, which is defining so much of the X-Men in the span of one movie, where they have never been mentioned before, and then all of a sudden the world hates them. I, I think that requires too much real estate in, in a film for them to build up. So I, I really don't know. I think that's the arc part. I think, I think the arc is, and, and I don't think that the civil war comic book arc was very good, but I do think that the civil war comic book arc, the way that it began was extremely good. And I, what I would like them to see is to use, you know, that, sort of thing basically for those of you who don't know uh, a mutant uses like his powers and creates like a nuclear explosion and blows up a school and i think something like that where people can look at these mutants and it turns into like a, a thing about race and and something like that where it gives them something to blame and i think that could put the x-men in a in a good situation or in a situation where it at least is more plausible except you've already used that plot line in captain yeah, in a war um, yeah. If you haven't established mutants, I, you know, so far in advance as something separate from heroes, you you just run into the risk of them just being considered the same thing. So well, I'm, not, I'm not I'm not saying it's going to be done in one movie. I'm just saying like what is going to be the thing that that switches this over into ma- makes it a a plausible movie that actually backs up what the X Men are all about. Because if it's not going to be eventually leading toward what the X-Men are all about. I frankly don't want to see it. You just want to see Speedball blow up. Dude, I love Speedball. <laughs> Grobby Baldwin, man. That guy's the man. <laughs> well, I we all know love- what the real solution is, is they'll probably just bring in Wolverine and let the rest of them go. But, and, and he'll star some 18-year-old kid I've never heard of. Which is how all of these movies are going these days every time they announce new cast i just like oh who yeah i I know i was like brie larson the female superhero what (laughs) well you know if she wasn't such a man hater i should be a little more (laughs) sure uh 
Uh, well, I guess I send this home by asking you guys where go. I'm at Maya Madrid and can be found on Twitter and stuff. Luke, what about you? I'm not. Leave me alone. Okay. I'm, I'm really more of a Facebook guy myself um, because I, I like getting my news from there and um, seeing pictures of people's kids graduating from the sixth grade. So, uh, yeah, look for me on Facebook. If you want to learn any more about those sorts of things, make sure you reach out to the show. Together we are kids seriously and we're out of here.